You could be the sponsor of this show and have your logo put right here. Flight gear. Light gear. My dear, I don't even know what the purpose of this is. Hello everyone, welcome to Taiwan Bar. Today we're going to talk about Taiwan's modernization, which might bring to mind Liu Mingchuan in the Qing Dynasty and Jiang Jingguo's 10 major construction projects. Wait, hold on. What about this gap in between? Hmm, let's pause for a second and think about this. Yeah, we take things literally. <clears throat> Why is this gap always ignored? Huh? What gap? The modernization under Japanese rule. In 1895, Japan took over Taiwan according to the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Japan took this island in the middle of nowhere and tried to turn it into a twinkle twinkle little star. How I wonder what you are. So they made Taiwan modernize with them. Of course, for other reasons too. But before explaining why we're so unfamiliar with this gap, we're gonna have to say what's in the gap first. <clears throat> Here we go. Taiwan's modernization under Japanese rule included the visible change of infrastructure and also the invisible change of lifestyle. In terms of infrastructure, first we're going to talk about Godo Shinbei's urban planning. Hey, 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 chill, chill. For example, the Governor General's office, which is now the Presidential Office Building. Also, the Taipei Guest House, close to the NTU Hospital, aka the Taiga Hospital and the clinic between Toronto and Istanbul, aka the Klitor... You get the point. In addition, the two major harbors that led to Taiwan's economic takeoff. Gosh? Uh, the port of Kaohsiung and the port of Keelong, along with the omnipresent Bank of Taiwan and the ever so famous Guisan power plant. Nobody even knows that! These were all built by Godo Shingpei. Recruited by Godo, Hasegawa Kinsuke designed the Western Line Railway, connecting Keelong to Kaohsiung since 1908. Besides the infrastructure, the change of lifestyle and customs were highlighted in the modernization as well. Japan considered foot binding, the Q hairstyle, and the use of opium as the three vices of Taiwan. As for the use of opium, you can smash that link to review every Thing about that. After the Qing Dynasty collapsed in 1911, people started snipping them cues and freeing them shoes. In 1915, the Governor General of Taiwan used the Baojia system for shutter island. Sorry, for shutting down foot binding and cue wearing on this island. And this reformation was successfully carried out under the police. Since girls didn't need to bind their feet anymore, they could work harder and contribute more to Taiwan's economic growth. Oh, yep. Aside from eradicating the three vices, Japan also stressed the importance of being punctual and obedient. First, about punctuality. The governor general introduced the concept of a seven day week and set Sunday as a day off. Oh, uh, yeah. So all the peeps who used to bust their asses off 24 7 started to have downtime and thought, hmm, what am I gonna do with all the spare time? Party! And thus all kinds of recreational activities started to pop out. Party! Besides the week system, Japan also brought in the standard time system. With the introduction of Greenwich Mean Time, the concept of time changed from the Chinese sexagenary cycle into stuff like 8 p.m. or so. In terms of obeying the law, with the support of the Baojia system, the police kept it so peaceful that people in Taiwan didn't even need to lock their doors at night. The governor general also introduced the Western law system. So Taiwan's judiciary evolved from the guillotine to a modern system with judges and lawyers. In the early years, these new rules were forced on the Taiwanese by the police. But after a while, people got used to it and became punctual and obedient on their own. Hold on, let's clarify something real quick. Ano, everyone seems to think that calling Taiwan a ghost island is a new thing, huh? The plague was a serious problem at the beginning of the Japanese rule. You might get to Taiwan and immediately want a free return in seven days. So even a hundred years ago, people were already calling Taiwan the ghost, 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 I, 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 le. To solve this public health issue, the governor general put in work to set up public health and medical systems. The National Taiwan University Hospital was founded, aka the TGG Medical School at that time. Also, the Baojia system was in charge of supervising health ed. As a result, the Taiwanese became more civilized. That's why you don't see us spitting on sidewalks or dropping doo-doos whenever, wherever. Also, the mortality rate dropped a lot. The population of Taiwan grew from 3 million people to 6.6 million! Okay, we now know that many antique and prestigious architectures we see nowadays, along with the change of lifestyle, a huge part was due to the Japanese rule in the past 50 years. But why are we so unfamiliar with this gap in history? Well, besides being accidentally forgotten by the KF... 
by the campus. Another reason is because the Japanese rule was in essence a colonization, and that makes many people unwilling to admit the good parts. For example, both at work and in education, it was obvious that the Taiwanese were excluded. Japanese people not only occupied most of the government positions, for the same position, Taiwanese people got paid much less. Sorry, kids. In terms of education, Taiwanese people either went to worse schools or couldn't even go to school. In addition to this unfair treatment, agricultural exploitation was even worse. Remember Kodama Gentaro and Goto Shinpei? They thought sugar manufacturing not only attracts investment, it's also the foundation of a colonial economy. So Goto went to Nitobe Inazo, who later wrote proposals for reforming the sugar industry. To, um reform the sugar industry. The next year, the Imperial Conference passed the Taiwan Sugar Business Encouragement Rules, which restricted sugarcane sales to certain corporations. The price was directly controlled. No matter how bad the price was, Taiwanese farmers had no choice but to suck it up. This kind of colonial injustice left sad Taiwanese farmers with happy Japanese capitalists. And the consequence of this exploitation led to the saying, the dumbest thing to do is to let the Japanese weigh your sugar canes. Alrighty. After telling you about both the exploitation and how Taiwan was modernized under the Japanese rule, we have finally bridged the 50 year gap! Back to our topic. When we look back at this part of history, either overpraising or denigrating Japan's influence on Taiwan is actually harmful for a full understanding of this period. Both can easily lead to bigotry and make us victims to our own preconceptions. Like seeing a hot chick on the street, but when she turns around, oh yuck! Uh, okay, that's all for today. Let me finish this brandy and we'll see you next time. Mm, bye! If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support us even more, you can visit our website and check out our crowdfunding options to let us make more of these videos. Until next time, see ya!